Um, thanks so much for the opportunity today. Thanks so much for sharing the stage with such uh, eloquent speakers. I, uh, I just flew in from overseas this morning, so I'm a little bit jet lagged. Just to give you some background, I grew up in El Dorado Park, and I am an entrepreneur. And when people listen to me, they feel it's quite strange that I grew up there. But I actually left South Africa. I studied in Israel. I did computer science, and I came back to South Africa. I left again, and I lived in the States for seven and a half years. I came back in 2004, and I've been very, very passionate about entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs specifically in South Africa. I think our entrepreneurs in South Africa are incredible. I think the skill sets that we have in this country are undervalued, not really recognized. And I think we have an enormous skills pool that we can actually access. I think people are just looking for the opportunity. They're just looking for a platform where they can engage. So today what I want to speak about is a couple of principles regarding technology and why technology is so important from a small and medium business perspective. I know you always get told about technology, but today what I'm going to try and articulate is what does it mean? Where is it going and what's the opportunity right now for you as small businesses? I think we always talk about it, we always talk about it, but guess what? Technology is no longer the domain of a few. It's not a few experts, it's not some of us that know how to code, etc. But technology is an enormous opportunity and I think what it presents to a small business is the notion that competing has changed. Uh, from an economic perspective, we don't compete anymore on the parameters that were traditional parameters. And sometimes the way government looks at small and medium businesses and the way they look at your businesses are that way. I don't believe that the size matters anymore. You know, the, the, we used to, in the Industrial Revolution, we had buildings, huge skyscrapers, and that determined your competitive edge. So the bigger you are, the best people you could employ because of your brand, people wanted to be a part of your business and be a part of your organization. And that gave you the edge. That's no longer relevant. After that became this, this notion of um, culture. Employing people, information workers, knowledge workers. Guess what? That doesn't matter either anymore. Now, size doesn't matter, location doesn't matter, the earth is flat. What matters now is co-creativity. We live in a world where it doesn't matter what you make. No matter how valuable it may be, you can compete on a notion of co-creativity. You have to make everything that you make extensible, augmentable, and you've got to let me in. Because that's the consumer on the outside. Consumers have changed because technology has changed them. The expectation now from your products and services is not just to consume them. If you make a great product, that's okay. If you're competing with a mall, that's a big challenge. But I can tell you right now, your competition is not malls. You should think bigger. The world is bigger. From a connectivity perspective, whatever you're making, there's a global audience that you can reach. It's never been cheaper to reach that global audience. It's never been easier to gain access to them as it is today. Why? Look at connectivity costs in South Africa. Just five, six years ago, we were in the top three most expensive telecommunication environments in the world. Guess what today? We're in the top five cheapest in the world. Per megabyte connectivity in this country has completely collapsed. We have always negative as South Africans, but I can tell you what, there's a lot of good news around there. I don't leave South Africa. I'm a technology investor. I invest in technology startups. I'm a serial entrepreneur myself. I've got seven companies, but I also have several companies that I have vested equity interest in, which I finance, finance as an angel investor. And I try to do this in my individual capacity because unfortunately in South Africa, the private entities aren't mature enough in terms of funding small and medium uh, technology entrepreneurship. But we've got amazing people here. And what I want to articulate to you today in the next 15 minutes as part of that intro is to show you what opportunities there are that you should embrace technology. You should look at technology as an enormous opportunity because guess what? Technology is no longer technology. It's not about what it is anymore. Because guess what? It's so easy. Technology is everywhere. You just don't notice it. It's become like electricity. You know, when we discovered electricity, we had no understanding of what to do with electricity. You know, electricity went through three major jumps. And I want to show you how technology is in those three major jumps also. Then I want to explain to you how big the world is and how easy the opportunity is to get to that big world. Firstly is, when we discovered electricity, you know how we made money from electricity? The first time people made money from it. It was when hackers hacked electricity and rendered Tesla's arc at fairs. People used to go to fairs in the United States and pay a penny to touch Tesla's arc in the back tent in the back. So no one knew about it. It became mystical. So they went in the back tent and they touched Tesla's ark and the hair raised on their arms and their heads and they were wowed. It was mystical. It was amazing and they paid a penny. 
That was the first time electricity was ever monetized. So it was about what it was. It is. That's what its monetization model was. Then something happened to electricity, which is quite interesting. It moved into households, and it became a fashion symbol. Hackers took electricity, and they made electricity in rich people's basements. People slept with the lights on in Manhattan as a fashion and a status symbol. When you had money, if you were wealthy, your lights stayed on all night. People were making electricity in your basement. No matter how it smelt and how loud it was, it was a fashion symbol, right? And hackers were making it for rich families. Something happened to electricity where it became ubiquitous and it became in everything and ubiquitously available and it then only incurred its impact on the Industrial Revolution where SMBs, etc., took advantage of it. Not what it was, but its availability and its consequential effect and relevance. That's the same with technology. So what happened to electricity? It disappeared. It went away. We created this wide area network to transport this utility. We didn't generate it autonomously anymore. We created standards. So firstly, as we took it out the basement, we put it on a wide area network. Secondly, we developed a standard, ACDC, voltages. So now you could tether onto this big network. Then the third big thing happened. What was that? A per minute utilization. When the per minute utilization occurred, electricity went away, but inversely so, became ubiquitously accessible, and it was in everything. So it wasn't the world of electricity. It was the world of electricity in it. So we don't know where this electricity comes from in the room. My mic, my voice bellowing in this room. We don't care. What we care about is the functional application, its relevance, its consequence. We don't pay for electricity to touch it anymore. We don't pay for electricity to experience it anymore. We pay for electricity because of its consequential effect. Technology is exactly there. It's not complicated. It's easy because it is everywhere. Remember when you bought a PC? In the 1990s, middle 90s, late 90s, if you ever bought a computer, a computer came, and some of you still have this computing experience today, a tower, a keyboard, a mouse, a screen, right? You took it home, you plugged it in, you installed things into its mouth, you fed it disks, and then you watched it install, and it was loud. It connected to the internet, making noises. Remember that modem? And then it connects to the internet. That was your technology experience, just like electricity when it was first discovered. You, it was very immersive. It was a physical experience. Today, you buy a phone. You buy an iPad. Have you noticed when you open up the box? There is not even a user manual in the box. Right? There's no external keyboard. There's no external mouse. There's no external tower. It's a screen with rich visual renders of information. All you need is connectivity. It doesn't even come with a support number because you don't need it. You see, electricity is dissipating. And in its dissipation, it's becoming ubiquitously accessible. Phones are no longer phones. Stop looking at phones as phones. They are computational devices. And for those of you that are asleep this morning, let me tell you what phones are. For me, they are peripheral sensory real-time rendering engines. They're not phones. <laughs> These are things with enormous power. And what we need to understand is the opportunity that this presents to take your services as small and medium businesses to the globe. Don't just become people that service South African clients. Think about the globe. Think bigger. You're not thinking big enough. When I pump into SMBs at one funding, in my individual capacity or as a VC in our fund, I get this all the time. I think you're thinking too small. You need to think completely big. And what we're looking for all the time when we invest in SMBs, especially from a small and medium business technology perspective, we're looking for people that have conviction around their businesses. You know, I've built a product, and the product is now being launched by APSA in South Africa, and I built it on a conviction. I went to the mayor of Ikurileni's office, and I was standing there with a multinational software, ERP provider, software that gets built somewhere else. And the problem with South Africa is we are consumers of technology. We don't make technology, which is very, very frustrating. And my message, which I constantly preach, is don't be proud of your children using your phone better than you or using your tablet better than you. Be proud of your kids making their own phones, making their own tablets. Because it's never been easier to take hardware, software. Because most of the stuff's pretty much free. You can make your own phone. You can wrap sensory applications and services around any product. I don't care what you're making in this audience. If you sat down with me for half an hour, I'll show you how technology can completely, exponentially increase the value of your product. But just building sensory awareness inside of it and providing information. I'll give you an example of this in a second. So technology is disappearing. And in its dissipation, it's becoming ubiquitously accessible. And it is an enormous opportunity 
which we need to think bigger of. So example, I sat next to this CEO from this software company from overseas. This was about three, three and a half years ago. And I swore to myself I'd never do this again. You know what I did? I was sitting in the mayor of a metro in Gauteng. And I was going to introduce him to the CEO of the software, multinational company, so he could buy the software and make a deal. And you know what happened? When we were sitting there, someone walked in and she was crying. Uh, a black lady, she walked in and she was completely in tears. And she had a baby wrapped in a blanket around her back. She walked in and she, you know, she gained access to the mayor before we saw him. And I asked the secretary, what's the problem here? Why is this lady crying? She said, you know what? Somebody went to our house because she had not paid electricity, her water and light bill, and they switched it off from the, from the municipality. They just switched it off. She had credit cards, she had money, but the problem is payment takes three weeks for full recon. And because he switched off her utilities, guess what? She gave birth to twins, one of her twins died of exposure. Right? And I decided right there that I was going to solve that lady's problem. And I created a company at that time, it was called Green Moon, it's now called Thumbs Up. And I wanted to solve payment, because payment is a large challenge for you folks. If I take a look at SMBs that service my home, people that do plumbing, electricity, uh, maintenance generally in my home, the, more, the biggest challenges, the challenge is not technology, the challenge is not the product and service that they can deliver, the challenge is payment. Payment is just too freaking hard. It takes too much. You, you write it on a piece of paper, then they don't pay you. Then you have to go drive back then. Call, and EFTs are expensive, and rate, etc. So what we did is, we, I bought a bunch of really smart people together, and we created a company called Thumbs Up. And Thumbs Up has now been announced in South Africa, and it's a little device. And you'll know about it in the next few months. It's built in South Africa. It will be shipped globally. Right? Our focus is not South Africa. It is that lady in that mayor's office. But we believe this is a global challenge for all SMBs everywhere. I've had so much pressure in the last three years to take this company out of South Africa and leave South Africa. Right? And I've refused to do that. We want to stay here with it. Um, so we built this little device. It's, it's about that big. It plugs into the audio jack of your phone. And it allows you to securely take card payments. APSA is going to distribute this little device for free to SMBs. So if you want to take payments, you show up at someone's house, you want to sell your product and service out of your boot, out of your little spaza shop, you can now take electronic payments by just plugging that little device linked to your merchant account, to your phone, and you can accept payments. Right? This is a challenge globally. Because we built this company with a bigger mindset in place, guess what? We now have 48 employees, and we, just by doing a quick calculation, are responsible for about 2,800 jobs in South Africa. We are making the payment pebble in Randburg. Right? It's the same company that does DSTV in, uh, um, um, decoders. They're building our payment pebble. We're shipping it to Australia Q1 next year. We're shipping it to Scandinavia um, in Q1 also next year. So I feel your pain as SMBs, but I need to make you understand that technology is an enormous opportunity for you. And wrap yourselves around it. So let me go through some slides, else the folks don't get their money's worth and I'm in trouble. So let's give them their money's worth. Okay, so I just, you know, philosophically again, from a technology perspective, I think we've gone through these big jumps, and I apologize for the resolution on the screen. Um, we've gone through big jumps. The first time we ever used technology was actually organic. We sat around campfires and we shared stories. The chief told this, the, the elders told the young ones, the big hard drives with the gray hair would share information with the small hard drives sitting around the fire. Don't go there, don't do that. We started using larynxes in our throats. That was technology. Don't think of technology in bits and bytes. Then a big jump happened again in humanity. Speech helped us to survive. Then we took another big leap forward, which was writing. You know, writing, putting our thoughts on books, is less than generally available, less than 100 to 120 years old. Do you know that 120 years ago in Europe, when someone could read, it was an event in a town square, where someone sat down and they became the human modem that took the information that somebody else wrote on a page and translated it so the entire audience could understand it. That was a, an amazing thing, you know, to see that happen. Books, when it became generally available, changed you. You took away someone else's thoughts and you became contemplative. It switched on receptors in your brain that you'd never used before. You were actually consuming somebody else's thoughts. You know what? Copernicus and some of these thought leaders that we had in those days, in the 1700s, actually warned leadership of the day and said, hey, if all mankind store their thoughts in books, they'll go mad. People will go insane, right? 
um, and take a look at how big a jump. You know that pornography pushes technology all the time. All the time. In Paris, photography changed mankind. For the first time, men could take pictures of a prostitute away in their hand of a naked woman and be contemplative about that naked picture. This happened not too long ago in Paris. Men had never had that opportunity before. It changed mankind. It changed us from taking our thoughts. It made us contemplate. We put our thoughts on paper. Incredible. Now we're in this age. And that age, what you see there, that's a snapshot of the internet as it is today. That's a snapshot of all the IP addresses, the little connected nodes on the internet. And every one of those little sparkles is a, an address range. That's that amplification bottom right. And look at how it looks. It looks like a brain, doesn't it? It looks more or less like your cerebra. But if you, if you take a look at what's going on, the information in that network is no longer information that companies are making. Kevin Kelly, a, a renowned uh, ICT researcher, did a study um, last year of total internet traffic. Did you know that total internet traffic in the, in the world, more than 84% of total internet traffic was giving, not taking. That means people are publishing more information and creating information on the edges of this network than what happens inside the network. The most valuable businesses in the world today understand that it doesn't matter that you provide a product or a service. They understand what matters is providing an architecture of participation. You need to allow me in to make what you make better. You need to make your businesses hackable. Every product that you have, think about how you can let other people in. Technology allows this, and technology changes our expectation about your products and services. We want to be in. There's this law called Bill Joy's Law that says no matter what business you are in, no matter who you are, because of technology, there are always smarter people on the outside and more of them that you can harness than on the inside of your business. And business sustainability now is about co-creativity. Businesses that will be sustainable moving forward aren't businesses that make great things. It will be businesses that make great things and services but allow other people in. Think about it, the most valuable companies in the world today, who are they in the top five? Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube. If you take all our videos out of YouTube, what would be in YouTube? Nothing. You take all our stuff out of Facebook that we put in, what would be left? Nothing. You took all our content that we put on the internet off, what would be left? No Google. Nothing. See, the future now is no longer about making great products and services, it's about creating platforms, electronic digital platforms that allow people in to make your businesses better. And that's the gist now. So you need to think about technology and its consequence to your business and less about what it means, how to use it. It doesn't matter. It's being used by everywhere. It is in everyone's hands. Do you know, if you take a look at my phone, I've got a HTC One, but you know the latest iPhone 5S, the one that everyone's bragging about, or the Samsung S4? Take a look at the Samsung S4. That will be the entry level prepaid phone in South Africa in the next 36 months. Think about that for a second. How will that change your business? How will, how will that change the consumer's expectation when engaging with the business? What opportunities does that present? Not just from a competitive perspective, but a competitive edge perspective. You see, technology does not change sequentially. Technology changes exponentially. Governments struggle with this. They don't understand how to comprehend this. Businesses, never mind businesses, you know, at the moment, when you employ somebody that's 18 years old or 22, 23 out of university and they go work at a bank, a bank has cool technology, but you know what? The kids go there, they don't want to work there. You give them a laptop, a Lenovo laptop with Windows on it. You know, you give them a Microsoft Exchange mailbox with 10 megabytes of space. If, when they log into things on the network, everything understands them differently. On the outside, they can get Gmail, 8 gigs free. Facebook understands wherever they go. Right? Technology on the outside has surpassed technology on the inside. It's Moore's law. Now, let me, tell you, let me give you some examples of how quick this change happens. And this change is tectonic, and it's happening right now. And I think businesses like yourselves, SMBs, need to realize that there's such amazing opportunity. Now, I think UJ is such a great platform because UJ has immense amounts of young skills. And if you are SMB, you won't believe how hungry students are to engage with real-world businesses to add value. And if you can let them in, it's amazing what they'll think about your products and services from a technology perspective to make it better. Think about how quick technology changes, right? It doesn't change step by step. If you take zero to 30 steps with with, um, mathematically, 
uh, sequentially, you take 30 steps, you're 30. If you do it exponentially, when you take 30 steps, guess where you are? You're at a billion. Technology moves exponentially, not sequentially. And we need to wake up. Four, four years ago, less than 48 months ago, nobody in this room knew what an iPad was or even looked like. 48 months or more ago, none of you understood Facebook. None of you were in Facebook. 48 months ago, none of you were in Twitter. 48 months ago, none of you knew what an LED flat panel screen TV was. None of you. See, it changes every 36 to 48 months. Now think to yourself, what's next? What's coming next? And ubiquitous availability of this technology is your competitive edge. It's the opportunity that's presented to you. OK, this is what killed Kodak. You know, I ask this question a lot to executives. Um, you know, what killed Kodak? Kodak declared bankruptcy as a business. They were a huge business. If you told me 24 months ago Kodak would be bankrupt, I would have said, forget it. No way. But you know what killed Kodak? It was a business that didn't understand that it's not about technology anymore. It is about humanity. Think less about technology in technological terms. Think about technology in the expression of humanity terms. What this company kept on focusing on, and they believed in that old industrial way, was they're going to take all their resources and apply it to making a camera more yellow that could go deep underwater with a brighter flash. Because that's, they thought making a better product would give them a competitive edge. Ask Sony if that worked with the iPod. Sony should have won the mobile music war. They had, a, uh, remember the Sony Walkman with the disc in, with the graphic equalizer, with all the buttons, and the yellow headsets. Along came an iPod and took all the technology away, but understood humanity better and understood that people didn't want to listen to music that way. They wanted to consume music in a particular way because music is a form of an expression of humanity. And a CEO that understood humans more won the music battle. This company got killed not because its technology was inferior, but because humanity's expectation from photography changed. I don't care if I take a picture of you and it's grainy and horrible. All you need to do is give me the ability to put it on a social media stream where someone can click the like button or someone can retweet it. Because you know what? When someone clicks the like button, I feel a part of something. It's the core nature of a human being to be recognized, to get attribution. And what they forgot was that it wasn't the quality. They forgot that their products and services was actually capturing lives in still pictures. And what people wanted to do was share that. And MIT professors showed when someone clicks the like button on a picture, you actually have a hormonal change in your body. It makes you feel really good. When someone recognizes you, makes you feel a part of something, that's what SMBs and businesses need to understand today. Technology allows people to take your product and service, make it better, but also to express themselves through your products and services. What killed Kodak isn't technology. What killed Kodak wasn't a competitor across the road, not even a conglomeration of competitors. What killed Kodak was humanity. Their lack of understanding that it wasn't about technology. It was the functional consequence of technology. Technology is disappearing, people. It's going away, right? Before, take a look at it. Sony iPod. I can give you another example. How did you get here this morning? Some of you may have used your phones with Google Maps. How did you get here 10 years ago? You opened up your cubbyhole and you took out a physical map book, right? You opened up a map. Some of you still came this way this morning. Um, but you open up a physical map book and you say A7, how to get there, physically opening it up. The function of geo was printed on a book and you had a physical experience. Then what happened? Garmin in your car, in your hand, your GPS, a beautiful visual render of geo. So now you put it into your car, you put it into your phone. Google Maps, it doesn't even ask you where you are, and it takes you efficiently by walking, public transportation, car, amazing, visual. What's the next big step? A better Google Maps? A more visual experience of the technology? No. It's the Google autonomous driving vehicle. Google self-driving car. The way they advertise that car is a blind guy gets in the car, he sits in, closes the door, and he tells the car, take me to Taco Bell. And the car takes him there securely and back home. It is no longer the visual experience of the technology. It is the functional engagement, its consequential function, and an application that you experience. See? 
Stop focusing on technology the way you're looking at it today. Look at technology as its consequential benefit to your business. How can you wrap your products and services and whatever you make around that? That's sustainability. That's competitive edge. This company forgot about that. This company lost its way. This company thought it was just about technology, but it's not. I want to just, this is a government leader that came to a conference, which was very, very interesting. I was at a conference uh, beginning of this year. Now, at the back, that's PopTech. Now, PopTech is filled with people, uh, you know, I usually don't dress in a suit, by the way. Um, it's usually with people with slops and shorts and t-shirts, hackers, right? They go to PopTech. That's the Icelandic prime minister. He came to PopTech. He showed up unexpectedly to sit into sessions to understand what the hell is going on. Because as a government official, he didn't understand what's going on. And you know what? I, I, I got to meet him a little bit, and, and I spoke to him about this analogy that, you know, the, the problem right now is because technology has moved so fast, government services are not keeping up, and government keeps thinking that it needs to do better things. Government has lost the notion of co-creativity, but it's got to go there. Government needs to open up. It needs to create architectures of participation. It doesn't need to give us good products and services. We actually want to make those products and services better for you, with you, right? We always treat government as a vending machine. We put money in, products fall out. Products don't fall out, what do we do? Shake the vending machine, we toy toy. <laughs> vending machine government. We need to change our notion of governance. It can't work that way. I spoke to him about that. And he said that's exactly why he's at the conference. And these are the things that he said. Now, I'm, I'm going to jump very quickly. He talks about there's a shift in implications about the social media and technology. What does it mean? He talks about this third shift. He says there's a shift in time. Technology is changing time. Technology is changing the ability to forget, and I'll get to that in a second. But he speaks there in the last paragraph. Let me read this. He says, we're seeing a shift in time. He says, the time element is of crucial importance because all of us who are now in positions of power in the world, including myself, we have all been trained through political training and elective offices in slow, deliberate, complicated processes of decision making to deal with fundamental legislation. This is no longer possible. You have a situation where through social media, the people or the crowd will give you their answer, will give the president at their answer even before he finishes his speech. See, time has gone. Time has disappeared. So as an SMB, you can't think about you have time. You can't think about making products and services and thinking in the old industrial way. You've got to think differently. Even governments have this pressure on them. Right? Technology is changing humanity's ability to forget. The other day I was on radio and I spoke to Jennicus Williams about this, right, on air, that we are losing our ability to forget. You know, on time and forgetfulness, think about when you WhatsApp somebody, you can see when they read it, and then when they don't reply, you think they're rude, right? Reply, you've read it. I can see you online. Why don't you reply? Time. That ability to leave the voice message and later get back, it's changing. The ability to forget. People are losing the ability to forget. We've, we're publishing so much of our lives up into this thing, into this ether, that we're losing the ability to forget. And I always tell people, a perpetual memory is a paralysis to society. These are the consequences of technology, right? And I think what we need to understand is the social implications. If we understand what it's doing to humanity, then I think we'll understand what the opportunities are for us as businesses. So in South Africa, you know, don't let people like this in. You need to let the hackers in. You need to let people that can make your business better. I wanted to speak about all these people, but I don't have time. I'm, I'm completely out of time now. But what I, my message to you today as SMBs, number one, embrace technology. Technology is your competitive edge. It is not technology in the sense of uh, bits and bytes and using laptops. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is have an understanding that technology is changing humanity, that whatever you make as a business, you need to allow people with technology in their hands in so they can make your businesses better. Sustainability is about humanity and understanding humanity and the technology that underlies it. Thanks so much for your time this morning. I appreciate it. Yes.